about five years old, waiting in line at the checkout stand with her mom when she spotted them. A strand of white pearls in a, in a pink foil box. And she fell in love with those pearls immediately. And she called out to her mother and said, Mommy, Mommy, can I have those pearls? Please, Mom, please, please, Mommy. And so the mom picked up the box and turned it over and saw that it was $2. And the mother said, well, honey, you know, $2, if you do a few extra chores, uh, you can start saving up your money and your birthday is coming pretty quickly. And I'm sure grandma will give you another nice dollar bill just like she did last year. And before long, you can buy those pearls for yourself. So the minute they got home, Jenny went to her piggy bank. She counted out 17 cents. That night, her mom did indeed give her some extra chores to do so that she earned a little bit more money. And the next day, she went to her neighbor's house, Mrs. McMaster's, and asked if she could pick the dandelions for 10 cents. And sure enough, her birthday came, and her grandmother did indeed give her a crisp dollar bill. And so before long, little Jenny had the two dollars to buy that strand of pearls. Her mom took her, they bought it, and she was a happy five-year-old girl. She wore those pearls everywhere. She wore them to Sunday school and she wore them to kindergarten. She even wore them to sleep. The only time she didn't wear them was when she was taking a bubble bath or when she went swimming. Because her mom said that if they got wet, maybe they would turn her neck green. She felt elegant and beautiful and important and all grown up with those pearls. Well, Jenny had a very nice daddy. And every night when it was bedtime, Jenny's dad would come into her room and read her a bedtime story and kiss her on the cheek. So one day, after reading this uh, story to her, he said to her, he said, Jenny, do you love me? And she said, oh, yes, Daddy. You know I love you. He said, then give me your pearls. And she said, oh, Daddy, not my pearls. Not my pearls, but you can have Princess. You know, the white pony with the pink tail. You know that it's my favorite. You remember it, Daddy. It's the one you gave me. And he said, that's okay, honey. And he kissed her on the cheek, and he left the room. So about a week goes by, and he's reading her a story once again. And when he's done with the story, he said, Jenny, do you love me? Oh, yes, Daddy. You know that I do. He says, well, then give me your pearls. Oh, Daddy, not my pearls, but you can have my baby doll, you know, my favorite one that I just got for my birthday. And you can even have the yellow blanket that matches her sleeper, but not my pearls, Daddy. Take my baby doll. And he said, that's okay, honey. Daddy loves you, and he kissed her cheek and left the room. So a couple of nights went by, and Jenny's bedtime and her dad comes into the room and there's Jenny sitting on her bed cross-legged you know Indian style and she's trembling you know her lips are quivering her chin is quivering and her dad comes in and says Jenny Jenny what's the matter is everything okay and so she's kind of quivering and, 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 and she opens up her hand and there in her little hand is the string and she said, this is for you, Daddy. And so with tears forming in his own eyes, he took those pearls from her. He reached into her, his pocket, and he brought out a blue velvet box. And in that blue velvet box was a string of real pearls. And he gave Jenny the true treasure. But you see, Jenny had to give up the phony treasure the small treasure in order to receive the real one. And so that is what we're talking about, I think, this month. And as a matter of fact, this is part of, I would say, our movement. We need to 
learn how to give up the lesser for the greater. We need to exchange our small limiting stories for those bigger ideas of truth. We need to move into feeling of feelings of not being good enough, of barely making do, to moving into these ideas of power and passion and purpose. We need to give up the lesser that we are hanging on so tightly to so that we can move into that greater, that greater acceptance. But just like Jenny, when our fists are closed, our hands are tightly closed around our treasure that we think is so important, but really on the greater scheme of things, we see that it isn't really the treasure that we want. It's just the treasure that we have, that we've told a story about, that that's all that we can have. It isn't until we are free to give that up that we can receive something greater, something bigger, something brighter, something broader, something along the more lines of what it is that we are meant to do. And we have a lot of times, I, um, where it's not so easy for us sometimes to be open to receive. We all are great givers. And you know, we've been indoctrinated maybe to say that it is better to give than to receive. And this month is about receiving. And how do we, how do we step in to this idea of being a better, a, a gracious recipient? Feeling like we deserve all the good things and not having to apologize for it. Not having to feel guilty because we have. And so this week is, I'm gonna tell you three ideas I have about how we can for how, how we can step in, how we can be greater, better receivers. So the first thing is um, that I want to talk about is the idea of being spiritually naked. Uh, which I love this story. I've told it once before of the new pastor who drop, goes into a small town, and so he's you know as pastors do, they go visit their congregation. So it's a Saturday, and uh, people are home from work, so he goes to visit some folks in his congregation, and everything is going really, really well until he gets to this one house. Now, he knows that somebody's home. He can hear some goings on inside, but he's knocking, and nobody's answering. He knocks some more, and there's nobody answering. So he's a little bit perturbed and, 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 and confused, beclamped about this. So he sticks his business card in the door to let them know he was there, and on the back of his business card, he writes, Revelation 3.20. Now, Revelation 3.20, because uh, I am not the Bible scholar, I should be, says this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice um, and open the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. And then he leaves. Well, this was Saturday, so the very next day is Sunday. And so the, after the collection plate comes in and the minister's looking at the collection, there's his business card. His business card with the words Revelation 3.20 written on the back. And underneath his writing, there is more writing. And the writing says Genesis 3.10. <laughs> and so Genesis 3.10 said, says this. It says, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So not that kind of naked. But to be spiritually naked is to really stand with our own authenticity, in integrity. So what happens is sometimes, uh, 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 so I'm, you, although I'm saying the royal we, you understand, it's kind of speaking for, for myself. But, and I've said this before, sometimes, you know, we have boxes that we put ourselves in. We, we have a, a, a description, and I've talked about what it is that I think a minister is supposed to look like, how they're supposed to behave, how are they supposed to act, and I paint myself into this picture of this box of what is proper and appropriate. And we have a ton of these identities. Well, what does a good father look like? What does a good mother look like? What does a good spouse look like? What does a good sister look like? What does a good parent look like? What does a good son or daughter look like? What does a good employer look like? We have all of these ideas, and we kind of box ourselves in. And if we're not behaving in a certain way that is this picture of our box, then we feel bad. We feel guilty. We feel remorseful. Sometimes we have some shame going on 
around our behaviors because it's not a, according to this picture of what we have defined. Now the problem is, is that whatever it is that we've defined, chances are it's come from someplace else. Because here's the thing, if everything is God, and God is all there is, there's only one, that one thing is God, it's delightful, it's, it's joyous, it's everything, it's all that is, and we happen to be cranky, then guess what? At that moment, God is cranky, right? But we sometimes don't allow ourselves this idea of that it's okay to not be in this box all the time. So we, we, put on the, we stick on the happy face, oh, everything is fine, but what happens is maybe things are not fine. And then because we're not showing to the world that things are not fine, we are not inviting help, perhaps help that we need. Because nobody knows what we need. Because we're, push we're covering it over with this happy face. And I think this is especially true in New Thought, where we're talking about oh, our opening song is our thoughts are prayers. Where we're worried, this is the royal way that, oh, if anybody really knew the real me, uh, what would they think? You know, they're going to think, well, what's in that person? What's in my, what's in your consciousness? Well, you know, why are you experiencing financial troubles? What's in your consciousness? Why are you sick? What's in your consciousness? Why can't you get a relationship going? What's in your consciousness? Why are you having addictions? What's in your consciousness? And so we're afraid of that. And so we put on a happy face when really we really are looking for some help. We want to be in a community of people who are not going to believe our stories. You know, I'm excellent at telling you, you know, my stories are so, sometimes they're so good and they're reasonable and they're logical and I've got reasons for them. And everybody in the world will agree with me. Oh yes, Janet, oh yes. You deserve to be resentful. You deserve, because look at what happened, or whatever it is that's going on in my life. I can get a lot of buy-in for that from the world. Because, and, and somebody else, who let's say I'm having a fight with somebody, a disagreement. You know, the people that love me and know me, they'll be on my side, right? And the people that love and know the other person will be on their side, because everything is a picture through what we have. But here's what's empowering. Here's why we're a movement is that we're a group of people who can look beyond my story and not agree with it at all. We don't have to say, oh, what's in your consciousness? That's not it. And so sometimes what happens is that there is a little spiritual immaturity, because I was right there in my early days. You know, I don't say those things anymore uh, because I can barely deal with my own consciousness. So yours is up to you. But here's what I can do. I can absolutely not agree with your story in a nice way. I might not, uh, you know, because I don't want to be rude. But why not? Because I have painted myself into a box. But in any case, but to say, you know what? I could see that this is a limiting story for them. I'm not going to agree with it. I'm going to know for them that God is right there, that the wholeness of the universe, of the infinite, of spirit, of divine mind, of whatever it is that we would call it, is indwelling right within you, and it is within me, and that there is no need for us to ever stay stuck. Do you want, do you like me to know the truth for you as you're moving through um, a healing, a remembrance? Maybe yes, maybe no. But what happens is that we don't even invite many times that kind of healing because we're not spiritually naked. Is that because we put on a particular um, facade of how it is that we think we're supposed to behave either, you know, we're in, in, any, in any area of our lives. And that we are sometimes ashamed and we do think that if, um, that if people knew the real, uh, sometimes I think this honestly, if people knew, the, if, if you guys only knew the real me. And so what happens and, and, and guess what happens? And I have stories. I could give you a couple of stories. I won't. Of when people did know the real me, how they uh, rejected me. And my feelings got hurt. And so I would say, see? See, it isn't safe to be me. Well, you know why it isn't safe? Because I've had a belief that it's not safe. So who do I draw into my experience? 
I draw those people in who are the good time friends, let's call them, that when I'm happy and chipper and everything is fine, boy, they're, they're right there. But the minute I'm kind of grouchy, I mean, because I'm never really, really mean, but you know, I mean, I have my moments where I'm not happy and do you know what I mean? Uh, and so when I'm not maybe so super perky, they can't deal with it. And now they don't want to talk to me anymore. And then I'll use that experience as a reason to continue to hide out to continue to throw that happy face on because I have evidence. I have evidence that it's not safe. But that evidence has been created by me based on my whole belief. So it's a whole circle. So in order for me to step beyond that, I need to remember that I'm setting this up. That I'm not a victim. That there isn't a group of people that, oh, if they knew the real Janet. No, the real Janet is 100% spirit with some arm movement going on. The real Janet is God all the time. The real Janet is a divine emanation of the one, whatever that looks like. And so the strength comes in being vulnerable. The strength comes to all of us. The courageousness comes to be open. Because you see, when we're hiding out, when we are hiding out and slapping on that happy face, we are really not in the flow. We are playing small. Because when we have also hiding out and putting on the happy face and acting within a way that is within our box, our comfort zone box, we're also not reaching out. It's not people not the real us. Here's what, well, we, again, me, maybe, we think that if they knew the real us, if we're out of this box, we're looking, we're easy to see, let's say, the shadow side, the dark side, the shameful side, the guilt side. We don't ever think, oh my God, I'm going to soar into greatness. I'm going to be, I'm gonna be a, a, a light worker. I'm going to be a being that is so attractive, that is so healing, that is so on fire, so impassioned, so on purpose, so empowered, so creative, that my life is going to work all the time. If I could just get out of this box. No, we normally think the other way. Can't get out of the box because, oh my God, nobody's going to like me. Can't get out of the box because then they're going to see that I have some fear. Can't get out of the box because then they're going to see that I have some guilt and shame. Can't get out of the box because then what? But when we're in the box, we only allow so much good to flow to us. And the amount of good we allow to flow to us is the exact amount of good that we're experiencing right now. No more. No more and no less, actually. So if we want to experience more good, if we want to receive more, whatever that more is, could be a connection to your to your spirituality, could be better relationships, better, more vibrant health, it could be more money, could be opportunities, it could be more peace of mind, it could be really making a difference in somebody else's life, it could be, be having more passion, it could be experiencing um, greater opportunities, it could be expanding your palate in some way. Whatever more good is, we need to become a little bit more open, a little more authentic, a little bit braver to move beyond what it is that we think we are. And so I'm calling that being spiritually naked. And so number two, step number two, the second idea, is that um, we need to receive something as simple, I'm gonna say receive all compliments. So sometimes how hard is it to receive a compliment. Sometimes, so I mean, this goes on so often. Oh, what a nice outfit. Oh, thanks. Oh, yours is nice too, right? Um, oh, you have such a talent in this area. Oh, if I could do it, anybody could do it. Or oh, it's no big deal. Or you don't even receive it at all. You know, oh, this old thing, no, no. Do you know what I'm saying? We're not even allowing ourselves to receive something as simple as a compliment. Now, if we can't receive something small, like let's say a compliment, number one, we're not working out our receiving muscles. But number two, is the universe going to even give us more? We're training the infinite. We're training the universe. We're training our subconscious mind about what kind of receivers we are. So let me give you an example. So you're like with, a th you're with your three-year-old son or daughter, and 
and um, you're in the store, and they want this toy, and you buy it for them. And so they get the toy, and they throw it down, and they stamp on it and squish it, and they jump up and down on it, and it's broken. And now they're crying and crying and crying and crying, and they want another toy. Do you buy another toy for them? Well, chances are you do not. Because you've already now have evidence that they're going to break it and stomp on it and cry and they're not going to appreciate it. And so, but we expect, so we know these are kind of laws of parenting, if you will. But we expect that the laws of the universe are going to act in a different way. So that when we're receiving something even small like a compliment, and we stomp on it and tear it and not receive it and throw it down and jump on it, but we want the greater... We want the house and the car and the relationships and the health and the money and the joy and the opportunities. We want all of that, but we can't even accept a compliment. What are we teaching? Is, is, is the greater going to be following? We need to get good at receiving. And we need to get good start with something simple. So I have an assignment. Guess what the assignment is going to be this week? I want you, I mean, it's hard. And it's not only receiving compliments. So I, at this week, if anybody gives you a compliment, your job, and my job too, thank you. Engage your family and friends in this. So I'm engaging my daughter. She's usually good at that anyway, without me engaging. And she'll say, just say thank you, Mom. So I'm engaged. So if you hear that, just uh, thank you. Say thank you, Janet. Oh, thank you. But more than even just saying thank you, I want you to pay attention to how it feels. Now it may feel a little uncomfortable, and that's okay. And then maybe over the course of a week or two weeks or three weeks or four weeks or however long it takes, if we continue to pay attention, maybe it begins to feel a little bit less comfortable, less uncomfortable, and a little bit more comfortable. Maybe we begin to believe some of these things. Because last week, you know, I talked about the Mac Daddy. The Mac Daddy of all false assumptions was that we feel unworthy. And sometimes I think that that's why we don't receive compliments the way that we should. Like we might feel worthy in a particular area, but not in another. So I might feel worthy to receive a compliment that's about my brains. Oh, you're so smart. Oh, thank you. But not necessarily about my speaking. Uh, you know, so like what is it? Am I not worthy? I mean, I don't know. And so I'm not asking because we've got to have some fun here, not to go and agonize over it, but just pay attention to how it is that we feel. And if we're uncomfortable receiving a compliment, why? And I think sometimes, I was thinking about it this week, I think sometimes um, that we're afraid of being stuck up and conceited. So I might only be speaking to me. And, and I don't even recall this, but for some reason, and I'm going to say right point blank, I don't think it's in my nature to be stuck up and conceited. Maybe because I have a lifetime of not being worthy. So now it's kind of in, 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 in great. But somehow, it is so bad to be stuck up or to be conceited. And you know what? I mean, did your folks tell you that? Or we look at somebody, oh, look, they're so conceited. Well, maybe they're not conceited at all. Maybe they're confident. Maybe they're not stuck up at all. Maybe what it is is that they're really in tune to their own spiritual power. But we mistake somebody who's standing tall and firm in their power, in their presence, in their love of life, in their passion, in their purpose, in their exquisiteness, they could be the most humble people on the planet because when you know who you are, it isn't about being conceited and stuck up. It's really about being humble and allowing something greater that we are not even in touch with to move through us. So, and that's part of it, is that when people are complimenting me, oh, Janet, great job, great. It's not me at all. So it's hard for me to take it in because even though my m mouth is moving, you know, and it is clearly my voice coming out. Just even on these last few words, I can absolutely tell you, these are not my words coming. Not that I'm channeling. I mean, it's not that. But at some point, I am so tuned in. 
And so, wow, it's great, but I'm thinking, but it isn't me. So if you have a talent and people are seeing it and you think, well, it's not me at all. It's hard to take. We're never going to be conceited and we're never going to be stuck up, I don't think. We're only that way when we don't know who we are. But for some reason, we've got to push away these compliments, keep them at bay, because God forbid we receive too much, and then our head is going to be, you know, our head is going to be too big for our bodies, or whatever it is. So we want to pay attention to how does it make us feel. And why, if it makes us feel uncomfortable, just figure out maybe we can tap in to what false idea, what little cheap strand of pearls can we give up and embrace the bigger strand of pearls in that idea and move one step into our greatness. Now, I have a tool for you. I mentioned it last week for this, and um, it's a 40-day gratitude journal. So I have them in the lobby, and I'm inviting you to pick one up uh, on your way out. 40 days is going to wrap up for Thanksgiving. And there's a, a ten, 10 things that you can be grateful for every day. Now, I would suggest that if you receive compliments that day, today or tomorrow or whenever, write those down that you can remember, and we can be grateful for receiving those compliments. So that's idea number two. And finally, idea number three is about counting our blessings. And you know, when we are in a state of gratitude, then, you know, we are more in the flow. When we can really recognize, and it isn't just about the big things, Sometimes what happens is that we, we have so many blessings every day that go, that go on. So many things that we take for granted. And so we're looking. We don't want to not be grateful. But sometimes it doesn't really enter our consciousness unless it's something huge, huge. Oh, wow. And it's, it hits us right between the eyes. Wow, that was something big. And then we'll p sit up and take notice and be grateful for this huge event. But you know, it's a lot of the little things. It's the little things that add up to a great life. You know, we can be thankful when somebody opens the door for us. We can be thankful if somebody was kind. How many times do you go through the lines? So here's another airport story. So, you know, you check in your, before you board the plane, and they, they scan your ticket, right? And nobody pays much attention to that person. And um, so I'm like fourth or whatever I am in line. And you know, she doesn't even look up from her scanning. And so I said, thank you. And so she stopped for a moment, looked up, and was seemed to be like a little bit shocked. You're welcome. You know, so if she was in a gratitude, how much somebody could, how many times does somebody maybe say thank you to us that we don't even pay attention? How many times throughout the day then can, we pay attention for somebody who does something for us, gives us a parking space, allows us to go in front of them in traffic, opens the door, um, brings you a, a cup of coffee, anything. I mean, there's millions of things that happen all day, every day, but we are not tuned in. We're so busy futurizing, planning what our day is going to be like. Maybe we're living in the past of what we should have said yesterday, that we're not focused on this present moment, so all the stuff that happens, where it's kind of beyond our purview. And we're not really uh, uh, aware of all the small things that happen. And so I would say for the next 40 days, um, put those into your gratitude journal as well, the small items that happen every day that we can be grateful for because when we do have an attitude of gratitude, when we really have a sense of appreciation um, for even the small things, that, that primes the pump for receiving bigger things, for receiving the greater. And we all want, I mean, we all want, it, whatever it is that you want and I, whatever it is that I want, we do all have this essence. We want to have that movement, that change in consciousness to give up the lesser for the greater. We want to experience our own perfection and our own wholeness, whatever that looks like for us. We want to, to participate in the joy of living. We want to ex follow our bliss wherever that takes us. And sometimes, for some of us, it's just taking us till tomorrow. It's just taking us to a good night's sleep, 
It's just taking us to getting to getting past this exam. It's just, but for others of us, it's more far-reaching. We have a bigger plan. And it's not that one is better than the other, but we all yearn to express more and be more of who it is that we are. But we can only really express that more if we're willing to give up those dime store pearls and move into the great treasure that is already within us, that is already around us but that we sometimes don't have eyes to see because we're in our box, because we've, we're in a smaller story. So would it be okay if your life got better? Would it be okay if you had more money? Would it be okay if your relationships were phenomenal? Would it be okay if, if you knew what your dreams and your passion was? Would it be okay if some if people come out of the woodwork to support you and your goals? Would it be okay for you to uncover in a greater way your own sense of the divine that is right where you are? Would it be okay? Are we willing to say yes to the more, but in order to do that, we need to let go of the lesser? So I invite us all to do that this week. Let go of those small dime store prayers that we've been kind of guarding in our pocket and move into that treasure trove that is so much a part of who we are. And when we move into that and let go of the lesser, moving into that greater, moving as the movement is in consciousness, moving into the greater, we are going to really catapult ourselves into uh, unleashing those ideas of our own limitless possibilities. And so it is.